Yeah, so thank you for that introduction, Matt. Um, thanks for uh, everybody that's here, small crowd, and should be fun and intimate by the end. So I'm going to try to go through this and not drone on too much and save plenty of time for any questions at the end. Um, you may have some, may not. Um, hopefully this is something to inspire some debate. I usually like to um, poke at things and see if we can sort of generate different viewpoints uh, to make sense of things. So I love it at the end, if there's people still around to kind of indulge in some of that. Um, I, it's one of the ways that I learn. So, <clears throat> and this is all uh, ultimately about me wanting to be smarter and being unsuccessful largely. But uh, I want to thank Pivot Point for having me. Um, it's uh, an egregious oversight on their end, giving the uh, typical conversations that Matt and I are accustomed to. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, so this is going to be a, kind of a retrospective on um, problematic issues within sort of the therapeutic uh, space, right? So like therapeutic movements that have happened historically, some of their origins, roots, we'll look at some case examples. And we're just gonna kind of walk through some of that. And ultimately with the hope that in the end, we can have some better mental models for making sense of how to, uh, how to navigate these sort of giant therapeutic movements that get pushed. And then oftentimes we sort of find ourselves in these uh, problematic spaces where we might end up doing more harm than good. So I think everybody knows me for those that don't, uh, Marcus Shoemate, uh, clinical outreach director for Green Hill Recovery, uh, transitional clinically driven transitional living program for young men with mental health and substance use in Raleigh, North Carolina, heavy uh, vocational and mental health focus. So, um, <clears throat> and then vocational, educational sort of focus, all that kind of wrapped in, but um, <clears throat> sorry, the chamomile tea is not working at all. So I want to look at this initially through the lens of, uh, of moral, like a moral panic, right? And so we're going to start there because there's actually some pretty cool literature on that. And we're going to cover it sp specifically through the lens of some of Stanley Cohen's work. Uh, and what I will say with this is this presentation is a little ironic because I don't really dive too deep into data sets, mining for information, that sort of things, and, and driving into like hard empir empirical claims, which is sort of what I'm asking us to do more of as a field, to be more empirically and data driven. And the irony of this is I'm not really going to dive into too much of that. I'm Instead, I want to take sort of a broad philosophical approach and observation of these things ultimately towards the end of helping us cultivate mental models that help us navigate emerging trends um, as, as they sort of happen. So in, uh, Stanley Cohen was a British sociologist, uh, and he's really probably the originator of the phrase uh, moral panic. And he did some research, and it was in the uh, late 50s, 60s, there was this sort of phenomenon that erupted in uh, Britain, where there's these two rival gangs uh, called the Mods and the Rockers, uh, because it's 50s and 60s, and that's in uh, Britain, and that sounds appropriate and, um, you know, appropriately Monty Python-esque. So essentially, they're just uh, young rap scallions that were fighting and warring with each other, um, just teenage angst sort of stuff. Well, the British media, for whatever reason at the time, called on to this, and they blew it into this sort of thing that was this uh, sign that the uh, society was collapsing, and Stanley Cohen found this sort of interesting that, that that was the claim that was being made. And so he wrote a seminal paper uh, book called Folk Devils and Moral Panics. And there's just a lot of stuff in there that I, that I love. Um, so a moral panic is largely defined as a societal fear concerning an issue. And I say issue in quotations intentionally, that typically has some sort of basis and concern for child welfare. So one of the, uh, the one of the things that I, the best things I ever heard in my clinical career, not the best thing, but uh, something that I heard is anytime you want to actually accomplish something and you want to get people motivated to work, use the phrase, but what about the children? Because if you use that, nobody wants to be anti-child. Uh, so immediately people are backed into a rhetorical corner where you have to now uh, focus on helping the child. So if you express con concern, you can get your organization to kind of bend over backwards and do stuff. If you just bring in the phrase, what about the uh, children? So oftentimes these things center around some shifting social norms, new emerging technologies, 
So a uh, quintessential example are like violent video games, right? So we've all, I've sat in on trainings, I've heard lectures, presentations on how violence in video games is, is contributing to aggression. And we've developed these sort of, and it becomes this clinical issue that everybody focuses on. But then uh, if you actually follow up and you look on the research, there's actually no good science to support that. Um, there was a big study that the APA did, I think in 2015, um, and it may have been even, a, actually it was 2002, I think. But anyway, it was largely debunked and unreplicable, and they found that there was actually very little correlation between violence and video games and increased aggression. The other beautiful one is like, you know, anytime new music emerges, right? It, we can all remember that Elvis's hips were supposed to lead to the degradation of all of society and Western civilization would collapse uh, simply because of the gyration of his hips and uh, the swooning and vapors that it caused amongst the female audience. And we can remember Tipper Gore in the 80s. I'm a child of the 90s. And she pushed the parental advisory explicit content, right? That was supposed to warn us against the dangers of this music because it was going to destroy society. And unfortunately, she picked a really badass label to slap on CDs and it makes them exponentially more titillating and it looks really good on a t-shirt. So I don't know if anybody was like me, but I can remember if I saw that label, I knew that I wanted it. Um, and I love the irony of that. And then, you know, new substances, anytime new substance trends emerge, you see these trainings, you see panic and everything sort of happen around it. Um, the two quintessential examples that came to mind, these both started early in my clinical career. There was a UT student who died from butt chugging uh, alcohol. And that turned into, this is a new emerging trend amongst adolescent substance use. And the, you know, no one ever stops to think about the actual, uh, no one ever stops to think about the actual prag uh, the pragmality, you know, the pragmatism of that, right? Like who's going to hold his ankles, who's going to pour it, who's going to hold the funnel and do all that sort of stuff. And no one really asks any sort of questions about that. Um, instead, we just kind of fall into it. Um, and is this giant fear. We build these trainings around it and suddenly you have a world's leading expert on butt chugging and they're doing presentations and CU trainings. And you have this little cottage industry around stopping butt chugging or something. And, um, the other example that comes to mind is, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers bath salts, um, but I remember my first year out of grad school, I was working in inpatient psych, and I believe that was the year that we had the bath salt zombies. Um, everybody was panicking about uh, people eating faces and uh, when they were on bath salts, and there was that horrible video of the, the man in, I think, Miami uh, chowing down on a homeless guy's face. And the police were saying, and the police unions were saying, bath salts are the new PCP, they're the scourge, and they're going to lead to more zombies, and Walking Dead is now here, and this, and the news media ran with it, and I remember being in a psych unit, and I remember five years after that, every treatment team meeting, anytime a guy was a little off, they'd ask, like, did this guy do, what was, it was, is he on bath salts? I bet he's doing synthetics, he was doing bath salts, and we'd lose sight of, like, the real picture, and we'd fall in love with this sort of exotic narrative about this and then lo and behold when they actually do uh, the toxology report on the guy they find out that uh, there was actually no bath salts in the system and the only thing in the system was marijuana and uh, I won't ask anybody to disclose but my history with marijuana has made me hungry but not particularly for uh, human faces so uh, but nonetheless, I remember every, almost every treatment team I sat in, anytime there was a young guy that would come in and he had any wacky behavior, someone in treatment team would stall the whole process and ask, is this guy using synthetics? Has he done bath salts? It's like, well, that was a great waste of time, space, and energy. Thank you for that. Because uh, invariably, the answer was often no. And if they had, the answer was often, I didn't like them, so I didn't do them again. But nonetheless, it raptured and captured our attention and directed resources and energy. So this is a great quote by Stanley Cohen. Uh, I'm just going to run through it real quick. Societies appear to be subject every now and then to periods of moral panic. A condition, episode, or group of persons emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. So I want to highlight something right here. Group of persons, uh, I would say, is largely a euphemism for social deviants people of color, marginalized groups. Uh, it's often, those are often the people that it sort of gravitates towards, right? Um, 
its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are, uh, barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians, and other right-thinking people. I love that phrase, right-thinking people. Um, when we read that word stereotypical fashion, the thing that comes to mind is the word memes. Uh, and so we all know the memes we share, we share with each other, we shift them around, we send them to each other. But that's a, uh, a phrase largely borrowed from some of Richard Dawkins' work. And he talks about this idea of like mind viruses, they transmit and get passed along, right? So memes in that sort of context take large, complicated, confusing information and distill them down into very quick, salient, working points that shave off all the nuance, but convey a lot of information quickly. And so the idea with that is our minds largely seem to have evolved to be able to sort of take large amounts of information and distill it down into workable chunks super quick. So the idea is <clears throat> with these, like these things get passed throughout society and they sort of infect us, right? So socially accredited experts pronounce their diagnoses and solutions. So when that phrase, when we read that phrase, think about us that are in this room. It's the therapists, it's the clinicians, it's the psychologists. It's the people that are educated, right? We're the social, socially accredited experts. So our words and everything carries weight. And I think this is a burden that we must regard with uh, great care. Ways of coping are evolved or more often resorted to. The condition then disappears, submerges or deteriorates and becomes more visible. It's just a lot there that I love. And then why not have a little bit of medieval demonic torture porn just to throw it in there and cleanse the palate. So Cohen had five stages of moral panics. Um, and also if like, if this is blowing through too quick, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. I don't mind settling down and at, like answering and going through stuff, but so folk devils, something or someone is perceived and defined as a threat to social norms and the interest of the community or society at large. So essentially you have to create an other. You have to create an us versus them. You have to create the enemy. Um, and oftentimes what this is, is whenever you see something shift or something is unknown, it, it sort of raises our collective anxieties. You know, we're largely social primates. We've, we've, you know, we've evolved to be detect predator, prey, threats. And so anytime something falls into some sort of pattern or, or disrupts a pattern and we can't really perceive it, it's sort of hardwired into us to create serious anxiety. Um, and oftentimes what we try to do is to make sense of that anxiety. So we have to create a villain, right? So these are the folk devils. And again, that tends to be the marginalized, right? That tends to be people that are on the outskirts. They don't fall into the typical social norms. The media and community members depict, depict the threat in simplistic, symbolic ways that quickly become recognizable to the greater public and often function as memes. So Again, think of the tropes and the memes and the things that we hear, the stories we tell amongst ourselves as clinical people, um, and how that conveys threats, anxieties, like merging trends and that sort of thing. Widespread public concern is aroused by the way media portrays the symbolic representation of the threat. So um, this is a threat to our society, this is a threat to our norms, whatever it may be, and they pound the table for that. The authorities and policymakers respond to the threat, real or perceived, with new laws or policies. This leads to systems arising to support these changes and creating stakeholders that may be disincentivized to shift when the new data emerges. So um, when we think of stakeholders, um, it's specifically in our, our field or industry, think of all these boutique and specialty programs and niches that sort of arise. So, one of the things that I, I was, I've, rem, I've been therapist for eight, nine years now, been sort of working in this therapeutic space. And I can remember the big, big emphasis and push on trauma emerging. And so I did the MDR training and I did, you know, I, I went to advanced MDR trainings and I did all this, all this sort of stuff. It's a, it seems to be a very effective modality, very valuable. But what became really interesting to me is that as that sort of emerged as a thing, you started having offshoot cottage industries treating niche, increasingly niche examples of, of, of trauma, right? And so what you end up having are people that have these specialties or these expertise and they become the stakeholders for uh, trauma treatment. Um, another good example is like a, 
uh, screen addiction, right? That's, that's a new sort of thing that we're talking about. But one of the issues with that is we don't even actually have that defined, right? Like we're not, we don't have any great studies on this. We're not really clear on what it is. And yet we now have specialty programs designed to treat something that hasn't really existed for very long, right? We don't really know if it's a thing. It's not to say that it's not a thing, but certainly it's probably not, uh, not something that has a robust enough amount of research that one should be paying uh, exorbitant fees to go receive treatment when there are likely very little empirically driven uh, modalities to address it or treat it. And again, it's not to say that these things aren't uh, potentially issues or, or present. Um, the other example that I can kind of come up with in, in, in my head is uh, like sexual addiction, right? Again, it's a, it's a thing that's not really well defined, really well researched. It's not actually recognized um, in any of the uh, you know, the DSM or things like that. Again, not to say that there's not components of it or things that don't exist. And yet you have a whole cottage industry around treating sexual addiction. And throughout my clinical career, especially working in the sort of behavioral addiction space, one of the things that I've often seen is the jump to sort of label someone as a sexual addict when um, their particular sort of sexual interest or sexual behavior really isn't that deviant or sort of abnormal. It kind of fits into normative patterns. And yet, because it becomes uh, bridges sort of bumps up against families, bumps up against some sort of social norms in some sort of way that becomes labeled as this pathology that, that may not actually sort of be a pathology. But we have a cottage industry that, that says we must treat it. And we have programs that say they can offer a solution to it if uh, with the right fee and, and structure and that sort of thing. Um, and the piece with this is when you get these stakeholders, they don't tend to want to give this up, right? They tend to have to fight and stay in their position. And I don't think there's malfeasance in that. Right? I don't think there's evil. I just think when you create a whole career, you create an identity, you create a, a program and your, your, your financial livelihood and well-being is uh, invested and intertwined with this being a thing, then you sure as hell need it to be a thing or else uh, you're going to be looking for having to look for something new. Um, and the moral panic and the subsequent actions of those in power lead to social change in the community. So you see some sort of like permanent shift in how society views or, or engages with the thing. So you often see these like ripple effects that, that last for years out. Cohen also identified these uh, as the key actors in moral panics. Um, so when we get into later on in the slide deck, when we go over a couple of different uh, case examples, what I'll try to do is uh, slide each person into one of these five roles. So you get the folk devils, the th authority figures, so like researchers, police, teachers, clinicians, etc., news media, politicians, and the public. Um, something I want to point out real quick is um, when we think of like uh, institutional authority figures and we think of clinicians and um, researchers, is anybody familiar with the, and then you don't have to unmute yourself, you can if you'd like, but is anybody familiar with the, res, uh, the idea of the research industrial complex? Um, if you listen to people in academia talk, they're under a tremendous amount of pr uh, pressure to justify their existence, justify their grants. And so what they end up having to do oftentimes is uh, just produce research over and over and over again. And they often have to start with some sort of uh, claim uh, or some, they start from, which really be, they start from a point and then they build the science to support it versus letting the science and research generate a, uh, an outcome. Um, they have to, you, you know, if you imagine this, you spend five years doing some sort of research, you don't want to come to the end of it to say, we actually don't know that there's a correlation between anything. You want a sensational headline that really justifies your existence. Um, and that's something that actually led to uh, something called the replication crisis. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, but in the 2010s, which feels very weird to say at this point, but the 2010s, there was uh, some statisticians and, and other folks started looking and doing meta-analysis on um, different, uh, like on like big research, right? Like all the all the major sort of like big publications and they were taking like hundreds of studies and they're running them through a meta-analysis and they were actually finding out that 
the stats on them, the math on them, all of that was actually really, really bad. And so when you look at it, one of the outcomes of that is they found about 25% in social psychology and developmental psychology, about 25% of the studies were, were could be replicated. So of a hundred studies that we build our clinical training on, that we build our programs on, that we build the claims that we make about things, 75% of that has not been replicated by science. Now, I don't remember, I don't know if you guys remember elementary science and learning the, the scientific method, but uh, replication is actually important for science. And so if you're saying that 75% of the science that our fields uh, in the helping therapeutic industry, 75% of that that is based on uh, has not been replicated and can't be replicated, well, you know, holy shit, right? We should be very, very careful with the sort of claims that we make. Um, just because something we say that it's empirically derived or empirically driven, what does that mean, right? Can it be replicated? We don't know, right? I mean, it, and you have to do really deep dives. And, and to be honest, my graduate experience and graduate education wasn't, uh, didn't have a whole lot of, I, I didn't come out a statistician. It's not my forte, I'm not good at it. You know, I'm the guy that burned the first four layers of his skin off his lips uh, five minutes to this before the start. It's a, I'm not the guy to go in and tell, uh, figure out all the math on this sort of stuff. But I think that's largely really, really interesting and something we should consider. Whenever we're making claims about uh, behavioral health, we should be very cautious about that, um, simply because the research isn't very good. So folk devils, they're a threat that incites the moral panic and tend to represent the threat to norms. Uh, women entering the workforce, people of color, differing cultures, emerging technologies, et cetera. These were all things, and these are all things that sort of continue to exist. And they're things that create some sort of social shift, right? They create a change in norms. And when that happens, it inherently creates anxiety. And so think about if you're normal, you have a normal routine, your day-to-day -day life, everything sort of flows and functions, and all of a sudden it deviates and you're thrust into the unknown your brain is frantically searching for patterns and you're frantically searching to gain footing to figure out how to make sense of things and to sort of decrease and diminish your own anxiety. So when we have these broad social changes happening, it's inherent that we experience anxiety with it. So oftentimes in these moral panics, we create these folk devils. We create an enemy or an other to go after. Um, folk devils, I love this uh, quote, folk devils appear as disembodied objects, war shock blots, onto which all reactions are projected, right? Um, so when something deviates from the norm and deviates from the normal culture that we see, uh, it becomes this Warshock blot that captures all of our anxieties. We pin it on that. A great example of this is, uh, and we'll cover this a little bit later, but look at the language in these headlines. Crack babies, the worst threat is mom herself. Children of the opioid epidemic. Look how dehumanizing this is. This is a quintessential example of folk devils, right? You take a social level issue and you distill it down into the most dehumanizing meme that you can possibly do. And then uh, you hit it with the most sensational of headlines. Um, and you create the other, you create the folk devil. Cocaine, crack cocaine came onto the scene and it changed things uh, in some sort of ways. And so immediately we started labeling these 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 people uh, is, is crack babies. And we're gonna get into some of the horrific language that was used with that later on. So the enforcers of rules or laws, institutional authority figures, researchers, healthcare providers, educators. So again, I, you know, I kind of go back to like the replication crisis, that sort of stuff, right? One of the things that I often think about with this sort of thing, um, when we talk about institutional authority figures, when I look at, um, various behavioral health programs that put out their own research outcomes or their studies. Um, I remember a, a, a place that I initially, you know, that I've worked in in the past when I, when I first started there, they had some sort of claim that 75% um, uh, you know, of their patients at the end of you know, five years were sober or something, right? It was this like marketing piece. And, and I, during my interview asked about it uh, and then subsequently noticed after I ha was hired that it was removed uh, to, which, which it should have been, right? Because if you actually look at the, the sort of structure of how they gathered that information, it's, you know, they call 10 people, seven people answered and seven people said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm still sober. Um, 
yeah, it worked for me. It was great or something like that, right? Or they called 100 people and only seven people answered or 10 people answered and only seven people affirmed that they were still sober. So seven out of the 10 that answered said they're sober. And now they're saying five years later, this that's our outcomes, right? It's not a very good study. And yet we'll do that sort of justify our existence and justify our programs. Um, and I, th I think that's misleading, right? Um, makes for good marketing material, I guess. Um, anytime I see it, uh, it makes me incredibly skeptical, but uh, maybe I'm a resting state skeptic at best anyway. So media breaks the news about the threat and reports on it and therefore thereby setting the agenda for how it is discussed visually and symbolically. So I think one of the best examples of this is how um, <laughs> like every single day, open Facebook, open Twitter, open Instagram, open whatever your social media uh, poison is, uh, by preference, mine is, is Twitter. And one of the things that I'm often hit with is uh, psychologists, you know, it'll be a headline, like psychologists affirm that men with longer pointer fingers demonstrate 60% more aggression. And that becomes the headline. And that's the thing that gets launched and run with. And so now, uh, because my brain is dumb and it latches onto things, now it's percolating in there. And my brain now says, uh, every time I see someone with a long point of finger, that they're a more aggressive human being. Meanwhile, if you actually dig into the study, you find out that there's <laughs> that's not actually the case or that that was a total misrepresentation because again, journalists aren't researchers. They're just there to sort of, their incentive structure is ultimately to sort of generate um, engagement. And if you can do that by creating clickbaity stuff, then you do it because that's their job. Um, I'm not saying this good or wrong. I'm just saying it's not a terribly effective way of communicating complicated information. Uh, five key actors, politicians, they enter the social cascade. I really love that phrase, social cascade, because I think it's a, it's a nice metaphor and that it captures this idea of like an avalanche. You take all of these incentive structures, you take all of these actors, uh, all of these, like, and I don't mean like movie actors, but I mean just uh, people, objects, uh, social panic, all this sort of stuff, and it coalesces, and then you get this sort of avalanching cascade effect where real energy builds and real panic builds around making something happen. Oftentimes, uh, politicians, you know, once you, once someone think about the children, listen, you know, without coming down on this one way or the other, politicians, I think, by and large, love uh, culture wars. Uh, as far as my existence, uh, as, as long as I've lived, I think that's large. That's been the case, and I think it's always been the case. And why? Because it's an easy win. Um, look at this billboard. If you're addicted to drugs, get birth control. Get two hundred dollars of cash. Um, some, I'm sure, some politician is driving this sort of thing, right? They love culture wars because they're ultimately looking for easy wins. They want the things that are going to make it easy to, to get reelected because that's what they're about, right? And so we create these uh, this whole cascade of, of, of laws and, and things like that. And so, you know, I think the big one right now, and I'm not commenting on the validity of it or commenting on one way or the other, other than to say, you can watch this playing out right now with the... Uh, critical race theory stuff, right? Florida, as far as I understand, I haven't dove into it. So it's just dumb bro science meathead, you know, kind of understanding of it. Like they passed some law banning critical race theory or some something like that. Why? Not because they actually understand critical race theory or disunderstand it or any, because they're looking for a win, right? They like, we pass this and we get a win. Conversely, there's other people shoving it through because it in whatever, right? Like, so the idea isn't that they actually care about it or that it's actually a threat or that anybody's examined this or, or spent time to think carefully about it. What they're looking for is sort of a win. Um, and so I'm, I'm always leery of, of the, the sort of culture war stuff. Um, uh, the, public, the public develops a focused concern about the threat and demands action in response to it. So... Um, given that we're on the brink of World War III, perhaps this is territory uh, one ought not wade into, but uh, I'll do it nonetheless, um, because why not? Um, one of my, uh, one of the most important texts that I think books that I've ever read was uh, Plato's Republic. And in there, uh, Socrates gives a criticism of democracy, and it's one of the best sort of uh, criticisms I've ever heard. 
Uh, he, he essentially argues that, and again, not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, um, and, and, and I think there's good arguments, but, but I think his criticism of it's actually relatively accurate. But he says that a representative democracy is one step away from tyranny. Um, and his reason for that is, um, though he essentially makes the argument that those that seek power are either foolish enough to think they can, can wield and control the power, uh, or they're uh, malicious enough and deceptive enough to want the power for, for malfeasance. And so they, that's what they sort of seek out. Um, and he says, neither are to be trusted because once they obtain power, they must acquiesce to the masses in order to maintain their power. So the public and politicians and media all exist in this sort of synergistic uh, sort of space where when we go into these panics, we can kind of create them and foster them and fan the flames of it. Um, so historical cases, uh, let me pause real quick. I'm going to give like 10 seconds. Does anybody have questions or comment or raging debate? Um, cause that's good to. I have a question. Please. I was curious, the meta analysis that looked at that found the 75% not replicated studies, did they, what, like what all were they looking at or what was the study? I'd, I'd love to read it. Yeah, so dive in, like, I mean, really, that to be honest, like Wikipedia is one of the best resources for diving into the replication crisis. So if you just start researching the replication crisis, you can go down the, the rabbit hole on it. Um, and so, again, I'm not a great stat, you know, like, I, I was going to say I'm not a great statistician. That's so redundant uh, and unnecessary. Uh, just to be very clear, I'm not, me no good at math. Um, so... When you look at the like, uh, essentially what they're doing is they're taking large data sets, so the like data that's coming out of it, and they're running it through different sort of processes. And what they're finding is that the date, like the raw data, is not matching up with the actual outcomes. So the claims that are being made don't actually match the math. So they're just doing these giant analysis of that. And what they were sort of finding is that basically 75% of these studies coming out were not really replicable. Um, or hadn't been replicated or, or anything like that. So um, it's, a, it's a good question, but the, the easy, uh, I would definitely read people that are better experts at that than me. And you can dive into that with like, just getting into the replication crisis. Yeah, I'd, I would love to read the, the meta-analysis that you're talking about. If you have like a link to that or yeah, you, know, you wrote it. it that'd be yeah, cool. absolutely. I'll kick it out later. Cool, thank you. Yeah, good question. So historical cases of therapeutic panics. Um, I'm going to cover two uh, with this. I'm going to do the repressed memory therapies, um, mainly because I'm obsessed with it. And I think it's super fascinating and interesting. And then uh, the crack baby epidemic. Um, and you'll notice that's in quotations as well. And again, because I think it has a lot of a myriad of sort of interesting coalesce, like things coalescing around that. So uh, I don't know if anybody remembers that beauty. Um, I see Deborah is nodding her head violently. Um, I, uh, one of the most unsettling scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, there's, there's two uh, in the original It when uh, Pennywise slides out from under the bed. I spent the next uh, seven months of my life as a child running, uh, getting a running start to jump in the bed. Least I'd be grabbed by a demonic clown. And then there's a scene in The Exorcist where uh, Linda Blair walks down the stairs upside down like a spider, and uh, it haunted my dreams for like seven years. So some of us, I don't know if you've studied the history of it, The Exorcist, but it was a really gnarly sort of interesting cultural phenomenon. Like it hit like a freaking nuclear bomb, and it just jumped into the zeitgeist and generated so much pop culture. Uh, it just it just went right it was this shocking movie right um so when we look into the repressed memories stuff that really really kicked off in the 70s um and really went through the 90s um and that's kind of when i came of age and i can really remember the satanic the waning sort of moments of the satanic panic stuff um and there were a myriad of social factors coinciding that contributed to the avalanche of fears about satanic cults through the 70s and 90s. And they were often driven by the therapeutic fields. Um, and so let me take a pause real quick, just to throw a caveat out on this. 
when we talk about the concerns of the like i'm going to be talking about this in a broad way in which i'm suggesting i know the motives that were behind this and i don't actually know the motives and i don't know that we know the motives and i think that's actually a very important caveat for how we should engage with these sort of cultural phenomena and really just sort of human humanity and human behavior anyway we don't fully understand motives and where they come from so i want to be very very clear i'm going to be speaking in shorthand um, my background is initially in philosophy so this is something that pains me to talk about this in an un in precise way, but if I try to be overly precise, it's going to become really boring and I'm going to uh, get overly anxious and curl up into a corner, uh, pulling my hair out and shaking and quivering. So um, with my inability to be precise enough. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, at least, uh, you know, that can happen after the PowerPoint if people are interested. So uh, I say all that to say many of the concerns about the satanic cults were tied to daycare centers. Uh, this there's like newspaper articles, all this sort of stuff. And it largely appears related to daycare centers arose as a phenomenon in the 70s and 80s because women were starting to enter the workforce. Uh, inflation was happening. We needed more income. Uh, there were some large wins, wins from the feminist movements that were freeing women up to have more equality. And so with that equality, they were entering the workplace and workforce in larger percentages than, than had previously been known. That really created a lot of fear. Like, what what now happens if the child is not being raised and you know, like raised in the home and that there be you know, all this sort of stuff? Um, the Exorcist was released in '73 and was popping in the zeitgeist. So that's coinciding with these daycare centers arising, which were a new cultural phenomena. The book Sybil had come out and focused on repressed memories and multiple personality disorder. Uh, interesting thing about the book Sybil, it was completely and utterly debunked, and no one really seems to know that. Uh, this was one book amongst many for mental health providers that fueled the panic. Um, and one thing that I'll say about a lot of the books uh, that uh, psychiatrists and psychoanalysts wrote about uh, working with MPD patients, uh, it turns out a lot of them were banging their patients. Uh, that seems to be a real common theme on that. Um, they, uh, if you ever sit on your psychoanalyst's couch, make sure you're, uh, he or she still has their pants on. Um, they really love to, to bang their patients, apparently. Um, and that's where the MPD stuff came from. And then evangelical culture was also contributed to the panic. So Sybil, um, in 73, Flora Schreiber, uh, she wrote about the treatment of Shirley Mason, just pseudon the pseudonym was uh, Sybil Dorset for MPD. Uh, Dr. Cornelia Wilbur was her psychoanalyst, right? And so I think one of the things you'll see a lot in repressed memories is it has a, it has a long tradition that you can trace back to Freud and the psychoanalytic tradition. Um, and I, I have my own criticism. I, I have a love-hate relationship with psychoanalysis. Um, I think it's fun. Uh, it's cool little parlor tricks, but uh, there's some pretty wacky stuff in there. Um, and I'm more than happy to meet up for coffee or uh, debate uh, or swap or go back and forth and stuff on it because I think it's fun. But um, Anyway, this book, it popularized the notion of MPD and repressed memories coming from childhood sexual trauma. So I actually have this memory. Uh, I was in uh, uh, undergrad uh, psych psychopathology, studying the psychological pathologies, and I have a professor that I, uh, I love dearly, and I remember him talking with great level of confidence about multiple personality disorder and repressed memories, and he made the argument that multiple personalities come from... Um, children being horrifically abused and then having to check out of their body and create alternative personalities. And, and even went in to show and talk about how some of these personalities have, uh, some would have diabetes, some would have hypertension while the other personalities didn't. And then this personality would have this particular medical, that was how powerful the personality was and how powerful the MPD was and how powerful the mind was at protecting itself from itself. And uh, despite the fact that there's probably no actual evidence of that and it doesn't make any biological sense right like we abandoned skepticism because the sensationalism sounds so much fun this is a popular film 76 sally fields um, and then within a few years of its publication reported cases of mpd increased from hundreds to thousands and actually here in western north carolina for years there was a uh, i think it lasted all the way up to the 2000s there was a uh MPD slash repressed memory clinic that existed. That was their boutique clinical service that they were experts in treating this thing that has largely been debunked, right? Like that was their specialty. That's what they specialized in. 
Um, so you could imagine why people argued for the veracity of this and why it had to continue to exist. Well, why? Because it's their whole reputation and financial incentives were there. So she grew up in a uh, Midwest strict Seventh-day Adventist family. She was regarded as emotionally unstable and sought psychiatric help. She became attached to Dr. Wilbur and knew that Wilbur had a special interest in MPD. So Mason later acknowledged that she felt as if she were not receiving the attention she wanted and began to speak from the perspective of different people in uh, Dr. Wilbur's office. Um, to me, this is really, really fascinating um, because I've seen this in my own clinical practice, especially sort of in, in residential settings where someone will crank up the level of crazy um, in order to get attention. The squeaky wheel gets oil. Um, and I think for us in the therapeutic space, we have to be especially careful and guarded with this. Um, and I'll give a very personal example. Uh, I had just gotten done with all my EMDR training, was an EMDR proselytizing enthusiast. And, and again, I'm not suggesting this isn't a, a, val a good modality because I've certainly had success with it uh, in a variety of ways. But um, I was doing uh, EMDR with a client that I probably shouldn't have been doing it with. He was like six weeks sober from a crippling Xanax dependency and, and opiate dependency. And, and in the context of talking to him, went through all the trauma stuff and, and really, really leaned into that. And he said, you know what, I might be interested in this. So we did, did a couple of marathon EMDR sessions and we had talked about the dangers of depersonalization and how to recognize, recognize the signs of all that. And so like I'd front loaded him with all this sort of information, right? And I'm, I'm caught up in the moment and the, the, the zealotry of, of the practice. And <laughs> we get this whole thing, right? And so he starts staring off and he starts getting wacky. And then uh, he says he's, you know, he's not out of his body. He's watching himself from across the room now and he's panicking, panicking. And so we do these grounding exercises and he comes back. And there's a few moments of like a few seconds of pregnant silence where I'm checking in on him and making sure he's safe and everything. And then he says, that was really, really unsettling and made me really uncomfortable. Um, I need to see the psychiatrist. I think I need to get a Xanax for the night. Uh, and I, I just love that. It was, it was great, right? Uh, I mean, he had me hook, line, and sinker, right? You know, here he is like six, six weeks sober uh, from Xanax. And, um, and of course, that's, you know, that's what he wants, right? Like that was the incentive. He played into my own vanity and my own sort of ego and, and desire to be helpful and, and all these sort of things. And um, it may have been helpful. It may not have been helpful, but, but ulterior motives have emerged, right? This dynamic sort of shifted in some sort of way. So um, that's my own personal example of playing into pathology when perhaps, uh, you know, should, I should have been a little more cautious. So Wilbur increased the amount of sessions she was seeing Mason and eventually teamed with Schreiber to write a book. So you can already see where the conflict of interest starts to come into this, right? Uh, Wilbur began injecting Mason regularly with sodium pentothal. I don't know how many, uh, you know, how much movies you guys watch, but sodium pentothal is a uh, truth serum, uh, which was helped people remember repressed traumatic events. Um, under the influence of drugs and hypnosis, the very suggestible Mason uncovered her many personalities. Um, so again, just look at all the incentive structures there. Look at all the, like everybody had a reason to, to not be pursuing truth or, or sort of accuracy in those moments, right? They had every incentive not to do that. Both Wilbur and Schreiber had incentives to ignore their skepticism. Wilbur had started speaking publicly on the case and become an expert on MPD. So her clinical identity, her livelihood profession is all tied up in this thing and it's tied up in this case. So she needs this case to be true. Schreiber had a book deal to complete. So you can imagine, you know, I don't necessarily know that these are bad people, right? Like I, I think they're complicated people, much like any of us. And so they were disincentivized from actually sort of trying to be, you know, to actually doing good and help. Uh, she became dependent on Wilbur for financial support. Uh, again, conflict of interest. Um, she ends up living in a home beside her. Uh, Mason was getting supplied drugs by Wilbur, uh, all sorts of stuff. Wilbur later destroyed most of her files on Mason, which is a no-no. Um, Debbie Nathan uh, is credited with debunking the book. In 2001, she went back and interviewed people, went, went, went for records, did all that sort of stuff and is largely responsible for it. Uh, ironically, her book was not as big of a hit as Sybil, uh, largely because it's not as shocking, right? It's not as sensational. But the repressed memory industry had started and begun and had become, you know, there's dozens of trainings and all this sort of stuff and experts that could go on talk shows and, and purvey this and 
portray themselves as, as experts. Um, and this largely coincided and blended really nicely into the satanic panic stuff. Um, this I this guy, he is a, he is a gem. If you're just looking for some fun, dive into Mike Warnicky. He was an American Christian evangelist and comedian who was exposed in 92 for inventing stories of his past as a Satanist. Um, I'm an evangelical kid. I grew up in that sort of world. And so this stuff is all too familiar with me. Uh, for those of you that didn't, I'm more than happy to sort of validate the existence of this stuff. Um, he went around and he was on TV. He, would, he was on CNN. He was on talk shows, all this sort of stuff as an expert on Satanism. You know, keep in mind that Anton LaVey, who created the Church of Satan, largely did it because he was a punk rock kid who loved the idea of absolute free speech. And this was his way of creating uh, sort of poking at, at social norms and po you know, pushing for sort of freedom of speech principles and not actually summoning Satan. Matter of fact, as far as I understand, he doesn't actually believe in Satan. But he, Warnick, he wrote a book in 72 called The Satan Seller, because uh, I'm assuming he was selling Satan. Uh, the book tells of Warnicky being orphaned as a child and his introduction into Satanism. He detailed his participation in sexual orgies, alcoholism, and drug dealing. And I've actually read some of the book and like listened to some of the Warnicky stuff. It's it's beyond insane. Uh, I don't know what goes on at sexual orgies. Uh, I'm inclined to believe that they're either largely and completely populated by guys that look like this goober, uh, or this goober is not the kind of guy that gets invited into sexual orgies. And I doubt there's much middle ground on that. Um, and I'm certainly wouldn't be giving him any of my drugs because look at this guy. Uh, he's not going to get any of my drugs, uh, mainly because I'm saving them for myself and not this guru. So he talked about his rise into Satanism as high priest presiding over satanic rituals, including magical spells, summoning demons, ritual sexual, including kidnap and rape, uh, which is, you know, ironic given that he was never investigated, right? Like if this guy had actually murdered and raped people, you would think that, um, there'd been an investigation to support that uh, that had happened. And yet there's none of that. He toured, used it as a comedian, using his testimony as part of his act. I'm sure that was uh, riotous and really, really funny. But um, so that starts to bleed into the evangelical culture that's tying in with the, you know, like the exorcist concern. You're starting to see how all of these things are building up for this sash social cascade for the repressed memory therapy stuff. So the most prominent case is the McMartin preschool trial in the 1980s. Members of the McMartin uh, family, they operated a preschool in Manhattan Beach, California. They were charged with hundreds of acts of sexual abuse of children in their care. Um, that's just an astounding number. And if you just think about it for a second, think about the what would have to happen to be able to you know, rape hundreds of, of children. You, you, you know, have to be a Catholic church or something, maybe, um, and have the infrastructure to support something like that. Uh, the case lasted seven years. It resulted in no conviction and all charges were dropped in 1990. By the case's end, it had become the most expensive trial in American history. That's probably uh, been blown away by now, but $15 million in taxpayer dollars went for this case. And if you have not, if you're not familiar with this, um, please read Believe the Children. It's a fantastic it's a great, it's a page turner. Like you can actually read it. It's a great investigative journalist that looks at like how we all collectively lost our mind in the eighties around this stuff. Um, this is the McMartin preschool trial, you know, in fairness to everybody that thought uh, ritualistic satanic abuse and child rape was happening. This kind of looks like the place where that would happen. So, um, you know, let's give them a little bit of credit. Um, in this case, the um, Judy Johnson was the mother of a McMart preschool student. She reported to her police that her son had been sodomized by her strange husband and McMartin teacher, uh, Ray Bucky. So something to kind of keep in mind with this, this is really at the tipping point of this social cascade. This is when everything has sort of been building up. You've got all these things in the zeitgeist existing. And so it's percolating in her mind. And so the whole media and the whole landscape and the police and therapists and everybody's primed to respond to this. Ray Bucky was like quintessential, perfect guy for this. He's an outsider. He's a Dungeons and Dragons kid, kind of a weird dude. Um, and so, of course, he's a social deviant. He's a perfect character for the folk 
uh, folk devil. So this led to a seven year investigation to fact, despite the fact that many accounts defied all logic, including that the victim was unable to identify Ray or Judy Johnson, had a known history of paranoid schizophrenia and alcoholism. And matter of fact, before the trial ever ended, they found Judy Johnson dead in her house uh, from alcoholism. She was a very, very sick woman. Um, there were claims of giant mass graves summoning demons, uh, children being fed to each other, Ray being able to fly, et cetera. This got so crazy that they, uh, LA County, or they spent, LA County spent so much money that, to go dig up the preschool to find the catacombs that children had talked about being led through it, where they committed this ritual rape and eating of other children and there being mass graves. And none of that was found. There were no catacombs or no holes in the ground. There's no bone, bones or anything. And yet the case continued, right? Despite the fact that no evidence was supporting this and that it didn't make any sense, we continued to pursue it. Um, and you may ask why I now have a picture of this cocaine fueled 1980s pure representation of Americana in all its glory and all its feathered glory. And you may ask, why is that there? Why? Because Chuck Norris uh, was, on, uh, was mentioned in trial by one of the children as being uh, there participating in the summoning of Satan through murdering children. Um, turns out he was actually nowhere near there and filming a movie at the time. Yet, they investigated this, and that didn't raise any red flags that perhaps this thing is spun out of control, that we've lost the narrative. Um, and this is where things get really salacious and juicy, uh, if, as if Chuck Norris and child rape and summoning Satan isn't juicy enough. Several hundred children were then interviewed by the Children's Institute International. So again, think authority figures, right? So she's a Los Angeles-based abuse therapy clinic. So their whole niche specialty is childhood abuse. Their whole niche specialty is repressed memories. Their whole, all of that stuff is in their wheelhouse. That's, they're the experts on that. Key McFarlane is the, uh, and she's a real darling. You, you'd love her. Read her transcripts uh, of interviewing the children. Um, was the, uh, it was run by her. Um, so she was considered an expert. She was called into all sorts of cases. She was loving the media attention. Um, and again, maybe she's not a bad person. Who knows, right? I don't know if any of us are truly bad people, but let's not pretend that it doesn't feel good to be considered an expert and it doesn't pretend to feel good to be interviewed by media, right? If the media came knocking at my door right now and asked me to, to, to sit in on a panel. Um, I'd be hard pressed to not want to do it. Why? Because I'm a human being that has an ego like any of the rest of us, and, and we like to have that fed. Um, the interviewing techniques she used during the investigation and allegations were highly suggestive and invited children to pretend or specula speculate about supported events or supposed events. So matter of fact, like uh, her handling of children was so bad that uh, she uh, they cr like basically built the don't list off of her like subsequently, this is not how to interview children. And these are now the laws and forensics around how we engage with children. So if you remember the like tropes in the 80s and 90s, show us on the doll where, where you were touched. Think about that. She, that was a technique uh, McFarland had and generated. So think about that question. Think about the leadingness of it. Show us on the doll where you were touched. There's not a were you touched or not, but show us where on the doll you were touched. The answer can't be, I wasn't touched. The answer is, I was touched, and where was I touched? Um, it's an unfalsifiable claim. So uh, spring of 1984, it was claimed that 360 children had been abused. Uh, Hecker was the doctor. She performed the medical examination, took photos of what she believed to be minute scarring, which she stated was caused by anal penetration. She was actually uh, largely, she was completely discredited. Um, and was um, uh, subsequent to that forensics, uh, medical forensics on how to investigate children changed as a result. Um, and at least all of you just get caught up in the sensationalism of this. This has real world consequences. Um, look into some of the, uh, the Innocence Project's work that they've done. They've done a lot of really good work on debunking faux psychology, debunking um, trial, case, like, uh, forensics experts so like something even uh we're all familiar with like uh the teeth like uh teeth imprints biting imprints 
and using that as like forensics investigation, uh, turns out that's completely unreliable, uh, has no basis in science, and yet people are in prison for the rest of their life based on those sort of forensic experts. People are still in prison to this day from repressed memory therapy, like uh, experts testifying, saying that these children had uh, memories, right? And, and there's people to this day that have not been able to get out. The McMartins lost their practice. They lost their, they had family members die in prison. It took them seven years before some of them were cleared and let out of prison. Seven years of their life because a social worker positioned herself without any ounce of, of humility as the expert, making outrageous claims that defy logic. Um, others believe the, like if you read, and I've read that her transcript, she bullies the children. She tells the children, I think you're lying, or I think you're afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Tell us where it happened. You know that you can remember that Ray Bucky cornered you. And so now you start seeing these leading sort of probing, pushing questions. They would interview children for hours on end until they were exhausted and tired, ultimately to get these sort of false confessions. And if you read what happened to some of these children subsequently, you know, 15, 20 years later, they're adults and they're reflecting on this. And they're, they have this tremendous amount of shame because people went to prison for this, right? And they're saying, I don't actually remember this. I don't know that any of this happened. I just know that this was what was told to me. Um, and I'll give an example, like a, a sort of a personal example. I had this really seminal moment that happened in, uh, in my childhood, right? And uh, you know, in my own sort of like, in, when I met with therapists in the past, they, uh, they would jump onto it like it was catnip. They couldn't resist it because it was so salacious. And uh, subsequent to my, my dad dying, right? Like my brother was involved in this story and everything. And, and my brother and me are sitting around a campfire and we're having the conversation about it. And I, and I start talking about it and it's just like, it has gravitas and everything. And um, it, I get done talking about it. There's a few, few seconds of silence. And my brother was integral to the story, right? He turns and he looks at me with the most uh, just authenticity and says, I, I don't remember that happening. <laughs> and so this whole thing, they're like, I use narrative that for years I've been telling myself and I'd had therapists sort of dissect it and pull it apart for me. Turns out uh, it, it probably uh, certainly wasn't true, at least in the way, right? Like, but it had been fed to me from various you know, external sources. Um, whoop. I don't know what that's about. So give me a second. Sorry. Um, there we go. That's better. That's what we're looking for. Um, yep. So later researchers, they found that uh, a lot of this was problematic for a variety of reasons. So. Um, here's a little piece. Wayne Satz, he's the reporter, made a big career uh, with KABC reporting on the case. Like he was the voice for this. He was on the national media, was loving his time in the limelight. Turns out him and Kay McFarlane were banging and uh, had a turd love affair. And so uh, he's uncritically taking all of this sort of stuff and amplifying it and throwing it into the zeitgeist. And turns out he's got uh, the best incentive in the world to continue to do that. And that's coitus, right? So folk devils, institutional authority figures, news media, these all fit into this sort of Cohen view. Uh, cocaine kids. Um, I don't, I'm not going to play this right now, but the slide deck will go out to anybody that wants it. I can't encourage you enough to watch this 10 minute video. Um, it's pretty horrifying and dehumanizing um, to listen to the language, horrifically racist, um, all this sort of stuff. Crack babies, the worst threat is mom herself. So you can see the meme there. That's the folk devil. There's a term coined to expose uh, to children who are exposed to crack, which is basically just cocaine and uh, baking powder <laughs> mixed together. It's not uh, not terribly different. But cocaine uh, was flooding into the country in the 80s and 90s. And if you're actually interested in this, look, uh, turns out the CIA was funneling it into the community to pay for illegal wars um, off the books. So the CIA was largely responsible for the cocaine crack epidemic. That didn't stop the government from 1994 making the crime bill to punish crack cocaine. 
Um, nice little cottage industry they have there. Sell the crack, rest people for the crack, and set up a, mill, a uh, prison industrial complex. Fears were widespread that a generation of crack babies were going to put a severe strain on society and social services as they grew up. There's an increasing awareness of the violence and crime associated with the growth of cocaine use. Um, Dr. Ira Chasnoff, this was in the late 80s, um, and actually one of my former clinical mentors, uh, still clinical mentor, but uh, knew Dr. Chasnoff um, and talked about how this experience haunted him throughout the entirety of his career in, in a way that really humanizes him. And if you read some of this stuff later, man, I, none of us want to be this guy, right? Like none of us want to be this person. Um, and we should certainly exercise grace towards him and, and really probably most of these people because any of us can get caught up in it. But he led a study of 23 children. And again, I'm not a statistician, but typically the cutoff for, as I, as I remember it, is 30. If you have a subject population of less than 30, you don't really put much stake of, or anything into the stats. Uh, of children born to mothers that had used crack cocaine during their pregnancy. Uh, they found that the children tended to be tremulous, underweight, and often born prematurely. He initially attributed this to crack cocaine use and the media picked up the claims and just ran with it, right? Um, and of course he attributed it to crack cocaine use because it looks so readily obvious, right? You've got this thing that's destroying lives, you know, destroying lives, everybody's seeing it, it's in the zeitgeist, and then turns out these moms that are smoking crack or using crack, that their children are, are being born premature and having these issues, and everybody runs with this because of course it's that, we know that it's that, it's so obvious that it's that, and he studied that, and Dr. Chasnoff proved that. Turns out uh, he didn't actually screen for alcohol or tobacco. Um, Oops, so I don't know how to get that off now. Yeah, cool, that's good. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So if you look at some of these claims, uh, you'll see stuff like the child, like they're never gonna be able to function normally in childhood. Um, what was one of the claims here? Give me one second. Good. So these children are not normal in the sense that they're going to be able to function in another classroom. Um, years later, Chazoff would note that he uh, got calls immediately after the study. So the study comes out and he immediately starts getting calls from the media. And so this study hasn't even been able to be replicated or really sort of understood. So he gets on the media and he says things like these children are not normal in the sense they're going to be able to enter the class, classic schoolroom or function in large groups of children. Jesus Christ, they're not even one year old and he's making these sort of claims. That's a bold claim to make with scant evidence. Who knows what five years unfolds, right? This is a new and emerging trend and thing that they're seeing and he's making bold declarative claims. Um, the inner city, this is a news report, uh, now giving birth to the newest horror, a biological underclass. Oh boy, that's a delightful phrase that can be abused in any sort of way. A generation of physically damaged cocaine babies whose biological inferiority stamped at birth. The hubris and balls on this guy, right? Prenatal exposure. Um, basically, just all of this is like coded racism and coded sort of classism. And, and all I like, I mean, I can justify that. I'm not going to because we're running short on time, but this is not the stuff Head Start can fix. So, American Enterprise Institute's largely people that love to. Uh, pull apart social safety nets. Um, so of course, that this is what this guy says. Um, and you'll notice that he focuses particularly on the black community and not uh, white people on Fifth Avenue who also happen to love cocaine in its powdered form. In the aftermath, Chasnoff, and seriously, listen to some of the stuff that he says because it's really a sort of haunting. You, you feel bad for the guy. He's, I was stunned and then angry that they would distort the information. That's when I started realizing how a lot of this can be taken out of context and used to bolster any kind of argument. Subsequent studies found that they didn't screen for alcohol and tobacco use, which actually explained things better. And oh, turns out if children are not nourished properly and have adequate prenatal care, they tend to come out premature. And that a lot of the symptoms they were seeing in school in terms of the shakiness and you know, hyperactivity, turns out kids were hungry. And when you started feeding them and providing them adequate nutrition, they turned into better kids and not this roving horde of crack babies. Um, and yet this was all the sort of thing that was in vogue. You had therapists and people that developed expertise in working with crack babies, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, that created these uh, fetal assault laws. And so you end up with a 94 crime bill that was passed by Congress. Uh, it created these three strike laws and you saw this massive uptake in incarceration. Uh, and mostly and disproportionately this happened to black, uh, black men, right? So this was a thing to go after. Uh, here's the categories they sort of fit into. So I'm going to spend just a few more minutes on this and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up um, and then take time for questions at the end. But these are some of the cognitive biases I think that were driving a lot of these things. There's, so there's something called an availability cascade and you can look into cognitive science and see this and see how it kind of plays out and re you know, like research some of it. But self-reinforcing process in which a collective belief gains more and more plausibility. You repeat something long enough and it will become true. You say something long enough and we just accept it as given. Um, and there's a thousand different examples of that. In the literature, when you talk about availability cascades, you have something called availability entrepreneurs. They tend to be activists from a variety of social arenas who ma manipulate, not always with malfeasance, the content of public discourse and strive to trigger availability cascades that are going to advance their agendas. Uh, when I look at when I look at this sort of stuff, I think a lot about the kind of programs that a lot of us work inside of in therapeutic spaces, right? You create these programs that fit these niche clinical issues, and suddenly we have an incentive structure to maintain them. And again, not out of malfeasance. Nobody, you know, these might all be operating from position of, of, of do-gooding, right? But if you create an entire program and you populate it with people and employees, and now people have a reason to try to keep those things going, um, because jobs are on there, jobs are involved, uh, people's livelihood, all this sort of stuff, identity, clout, yada, yada, yada. Um, and people will seize on those things and try to keep them around. I think there's a particular danger in our field, and I think it's something we have to be very, very careful of, right? Um, this, I love this phrase. This is a phrase from medical literature, laterogenic illness and psychotherapy. So it's the causation of a disorder, harmful complication, or other ill effect by any medical activity, including diagnosis, intervention, error, or negligence. So I think for us that are mo most typically involved in psychotherapy, where I see this play out a lot of times is in the psychological testing we receive, where you have these really, really advanced metrics to sort of go in and capture these different phenomena. And you get this guy that comes into your program and on paper, he's got this 30 page psych report and he gives you all the breakdowns of his functioning. And I can tell you, I've seen these things that make your skin crawl and you think that you've got a zombie walking in the door or something, right? Or a Tasmanian devil or a face eater or something. And the guy shows up and actually turns out he functions pretty normally. But we have these metrics and these things that can sort of path, like label and capture pathology where there may not be pathology. Um, I think about this often with the way that we talk about trauma, how we'll labor, label someone's experience as trauma and we'll go after it as trauma and we'll discuss it as trauma. And suddenly this thing that may have been benign to the person feels really, really traumatic or they have to start interpreting and thinking of it as traumatic. Um, I think about myself and my own experience in therapy. Um, I've had therapists label things uh, that occurred in my life as being particularly traumatic. And in re retrospect, they don't actually feel that traumatic at all. Um, but I spend an inordinate amount of time reflecting on them and thinking of them and viewing myself through the lens of someone having been traumatized and then sort of come to a realization that actually that those things weren't particularly traumatizing. And then in fact, the things that may have been traumatizing were something completely different and seemingly benign. But um, I think a corollary example of this is our medical imaging technology has gotten so good that we're able to like see bulging disc and that has led to this giant spike in back surgeries when it turns out that bulging discs are actually pretty normal and not terribly pathology, uh, pathological. Just because we can see it doesn't mean that it warrants attention. So I'm gonna wrap this up probably here in this, these next two slides. So my solution for these sort of things is epistemic humility. And the idea of epistemology is a branch of philosophy that studies knowledge and it says, how can we make the claims that we make? And how do we know the things that we know? So what are we saying? And so the idea of epistemic humility is that we exercise a tremendous amount of caution and that we hedge every sort of claim that we make. And the thing that I would suggest is before we really, really lean into things, let's think very, very slowly about it. Let's measure. Um, one of the areas I often see this play out in is uh, we'll talk about neuroscience and we will appeal to the God of neuroscience to sort of justify or explain something or explain the narrative that we have. 
And turns out that oftentimes we, uh, like, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't have a background in neuroscience, right? Like I don't have the expertise in that, um, but we'll make those sort of claims. Um, I think we should be very, very careful in how we do that. So be humble in our uh, takes, be humble as cl clinical therapeutic people, think slowly, operate slowly. When we're making placements, when we're referring, when we're dealing with clinical issues, let's try to measure twice, measure three times, cut once. Um, all of us live in programs that are typically referral dependent. So we inherently have incentive structures to ignore our skepticism about something. We want clients, we want people in our programs because we want to justify our existence. Um, and I don't think that makes us bad people, right? Like it, it just makes us part of an organic human ecosystem. So I think we should embrace skepticism. Uh, we should have incredulity, or incredulity uh, just whatever, you know, that word. But we should be incredulous about things. We should be very, very careful. Um, if something smells funny or doesn't pass a smell test, give it a couple more whiffs. See what you, uh, see what you come up with. Um, I'm a huge fan of Cartesian skepticism. So, and uh, Descartes, you know, he, he wrote this whole exploration of epistemology and he did this reductionistic thing where he said, how is it that I can uh, justify what it is that I know? Um, and eventually he said, sort of he, the, the movie, The Matrix is sort of based off of this. He, he makes the claim that he can't be sure that he's not under the influence of some sort of demonic force. Uh, that is, that he's not just a brain in a vat and he said the only thing that he can be sure of is that he exists in some sort of capacity. Uh, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. That's all he could come up with. That was the only knowledge claim he felt comfortable making was, I am thinking, and that's all that I know with any degree of certainty. So I'm a huge fan of existing in that sort of skepticism and space. Be very, very careful with the things that we say we know, because um, we often don't know. Human beings are not actually very good at prediction. We try to be, and we often embed ourselves and endure ourselves with a lot of confidence in our, in our predictions, and we're woefully wrong often. Be very careful, be very humble. Uh, Kannerman is an Israeli psychologist, won a Nobel Peace Prize. He looked at behavioral economics. He essentially says human beings have two modes of thinking. System one is fast, instinctive and emotional. System two is slower, more deliberate, more logical. He uh, encourages us to get into system one thinking. Don't follow, the, don't follow the masses, right? We need to think slow versus think fast. Think carefully. So when making major, major decisions, therapeutic placement, movements, um, any merging trends, that sort of stuff, slow down and let's think and let's ask the question, how is it that we actually know this before we start building programs, before we start doing clinical interventions that are based on scant evidence. So there it is. Uh, there's pictures of dogs because I hear that's uh, endearing. So um, I skated in with 10 minutes left. Um, so we can open up with questions or if you want to scream at me, that's fine too. Um, it's happened before. Any questions, debate, criticisms, thoughts, comments? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm curious if you've ever found like, and, and maybe it's just a, just a kind of a trivial observation or curiosity, but if you've ever found that 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 um, empirical skepticism comes in, and and with an ineffective counterbalance to something that may very well have legitimacy, like I, yeah, I like yeah, to be. Yeah. To be immediately and automatically dismissive or reductive of a of a of a presented theory or or, po or policy or practice, yeah, yeah, yeah. By like over over embracing perhaps skepticism. I'm not really sure how to articulate it. No, I actually think uh, this is why I have the Bertrand Russell quote in there. Uh, we must be skeptical even of our own skepticism. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, like that that's that's that that's my bias that I I often fall into. Right, my default is dismissive and skeptic. And in my better moments, if I get into slow thinking, I don't uh, launch into that, right? There's sometimes that things are, are far more serious. I, you know, I'm pretty laissez-faire, not a terribly anxious person. And so I tend to not catastrophize things. So um, I think that's a very, very wise, smart question. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there's a risk of that as well, right? We're not remarkably rational beings. Um, yeah. 
So um, thanks, Erica. Any other questions? I just think it was all it was super fascinating. I learned about a lot of that in school and we, I was thinking about how well my education did and training me to look at research critically. Like they really had such a focus through all of yeah. my years on like, hey, here's statistical knowledge. Look at the results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and so it's, it's interesting because I see it now that I've become so skeptical of things, you know, I think yeah, about yeah. like, the body keeps the score, right? Yeah. It's got a massive following. People love how it feels. They love how it sounds. They're all about it. And it's like, I've read it. Like, I think it's an excellent book, but right. he hasn't been able to have his research replicated and yeah. clinicians have, and researchers have been calling him out for yeah. years about it and asking him to replicate. And it's like, asking him to make edits to his book based on feedback yeah. and he's kind of refused to do that. So I think of that like cult following. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That of like, Such yes, good, this is yeah. an amazing concept and you know, yeah. let's see how it plays out with clients, you know? And I, and I think the real danger in things like the body keeps the score. And again, it's not to say that there's not validity to it. Right. I think that's a very right. simple claim or simple request is let's replicate this. Um, yeah. If we can replicate it and it stands up to that. Excellent. But the dangers of that is like, listen, I, I think that's like third, fourth, fifth generation of repressed memory therapy. And there's real, I think there's real danger in that. Right. Um, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think there's real danger in that. that we, we, we all have to exercise a little bit of caution. And, and there's not to say that I think there's a lot of wonderful things that's come out of that literature that have come out of that sort of thinking in literature um, mm -hmm. that we should consider. But but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should uh, run with it as, as gospel truth, I think. Yeah, right. or just like re replicate it. Like, yeah, yeah, go for it. Like, show us, show us, show it again and again and with bigger studies, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think this was a, a great informative presentation um, scattered with a little humor to keep me engaged. Yeah. I'm curious on, Marcus, what were you intending, what were your intentions for this presentation for clinicians? How would you like us to use this information to apply it to our practice? Good. I, 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 thank you. That's such a smart uh, question um, that, that I, I really, really appreciate. Um, where, where this comes from for me is a, a couple places. One, my own clinical experience where I would become enraptured with the new, newest clinical claim and sort of, you know, the body keeps a score sort of stuff, uh, trauma therapy, like these emerging sort of therapeutic practices. And then I would find myself launching into them and jumping into clinical, like clinical practice with them. Um, and, and I think sort of misleading clients or doing potential harm um, unintentionally. Um, mm -hmm. I look at these, you know, I, I picked out some really sensational moments, things like the uh, McMartin preschool trial, but we as clinicians should consider like how many times do we get asked our clinical opinion on something, right? Like I, just you're, you're at a party, you're at an after, you're, you know, you're somewhere and people start asking your take on something. And then we speak with a level of expertise. Um, when an expert speaks, people tend to listen and, and they orient their lives and behavior around that potentially. And I think we ought to exercise great caution with that. Um, mm -hmm. but, and I, I would say like, a, you know, one of the greatest pet peeves that I've ever sort of had was, and, and I working in a residential setting and watching clinical people, um, so I'll, I'll give an example, right? Um, this is, and, and I think this is like a, a good sort of, this is a personal example. Uh, I had this client in a residential program and he had done this thing where he's just kind of an, he's just kind of an asshole, right? Like he wasn't bad. He was just kind of a mouth, like a malcontent. And he was like a pseudo intellectual guy. He was like the 20 year old that thought he was the, a, like this aspire, like the next Kerouac or this great author or something. And, and um, you know, so just kind of rub people the wrong way. And, and for whatever reason, the culture there kind of ate, wanted to eat him apart. And so 
he did this thing where he took like gummy bears, right? And he started put, taking the gummy bears heads off and putting them on toothpicks and doing something and just like, ha- like just tinkering, right? And he's doing this at the lunch table and he turns it in and um, one of the staff members see him do this. And then all of a sudden I hear the staff member, uh, we have this clinical meeting and they say that he was issuing a threat, right? That he created this gummy bear massacre and that he, uh, in doing so, had communicated a threat towards kitchen staff by this. And they built this whole narrative based off of this scant data. And no one ever paused for one damn second to ask, is it possible that we don't actually know what his motives are in this? But we led into it with so much assurity, with so much confidence about what this guy was doing, and what his actual motives were. that. And I remember having to sit him down and try to say, like, listen, I fought for you to stay here. You're going to be able to stay, but you just need to know. And this guy is genuinely confused. And he's like, what the hell? Like, I was just he's like, I was just sticking around. So I think oftentimes we sort of see that thing. Um, yeah. So, so that's like a practical example sometimes, right? Like we tend to, I think clinicians, we tend to trust our guts entirely too much. So maybe that's, the, maybe that's a way more concise way of saying that. We should trust our guts a little bit less, be a little slower to think, mm-hmm. be a little less uh, judgy. Um, I, I'll say this, uh, maybe this is more helpful. There's this great article and it's by one of the psychoanalysts I actually like. It's like two pages. Um, and he talks about the psychoanalytic stance. I can't remember his first name because he's, uh, I don't know, he's like a German and uh, I'm horrible with languages, but his last name is Beyond. And he wrote this essay called On Memory and Desire. And he argues that a clinician's resting point should be, I have no memory of my client and I have no desire for my client. My client arrives and I'm simply open space and I'm not interacting with the idea and my memory of what this client is, because if I'm doing that, I'm not interacting with the client that's in front of me. Um, I don't know that that's entirely possible, but I, I, I like that as a starting point. Interact with what's in front of you, not what's in your head. I don't know if that was helpful or just more rambling, but. Yeah, definitely, definitely was helpful. And I appreciate the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and asking. That was a great question. Thank you. No problem. You guys have a good night. Yeah, I'll hang around if anybody else has questions. I don't even know. I don't think there's anybody left. So I'm here. What am I? Yeah. Top liver. (laughs) I'm going to hop off. Thank you so much, Marcus. Seriously, I appreciate your wisdom. I love this topic and I hope we can have you back on here again. Yeah, anytime I'll ramble on. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think you did a great job, Marcus. I do. You know, it's funny, earlier in my career, the thicker the chart, the happier I was. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Give me a psych eval. Give me a good one. You know, it was yeah. like a psych eval, a good psych eval was like foreplay for me. Good uh, being yeah. the operative word. Yeah. I remember you know? uh, Dr. Uh, Brian at Pavilion one time early in my clinical career, I was like waxing on about this client that had this really sensational story. And I never considered the fact that the cocaine addict would have a really sensational story. <laughs> I was like completely caught up in the narrative and Brian yeah. was sitting at the table and you know, Brian could be in his like weird uh, spectrum way. He's like, <laughs> he looks at me and he's like uh, in front of the entire team. He's like, uh, I need data, please. And I'm like, and then I would repeat the guy's story. And he's like, that's not data. That's assessment. And this went on painfully for like 10 minutes and this way that was like, it, it hurt at such a primal level that I never forgot that. And he pulled me aside afterwards and apologized for being a sadist, but said that uh, one of the issues he's always seen with clinicians is they're super, super light on data, super, super heavy on assessment and very, very light on plan. Uh, I, mean, I hate to agree with him, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been on the firing line of Brian Coon. What are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, we, the moment you never forget. Yeah. I have like a friendly reminder that we're recording this and it will be posted on our website. Okay. <laughs> he That's knows right. it's true and takes great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope he hears it. Yeah. I've told this story a dozen times. And it was like, it's one of the most important moments I had in my clinical career was that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think the thing of it is now I really love, I love age. I love 35 years in the field. Yeah. Because nothing is catastrophic. I mean, I see the harm we did over the years catastrophizing. Yeah. Just like you talked about zeitgeist. 
I remember back in the 2000s, I was running an IOP group and Medicaid and this thing called IPRS fundings, which is another government funding pool, were my primary ways of getting paid. And if I didn't give somebody a mood disorder, I couldn't get paid. Yeah. Yeah. And these are people that have been to prison on drug charges, multiple DUIs, yeah. and, and they didn't care about any of that data. Right. But I had to make stuff up out of the DSM yeah. to get the paid for it. So I'm calling on my buddies who've been in the field a long time. And mm-hmm. that word you used, I said, do we have zeitgeist in our field? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm used to like hemlines and heels and colors and, and that <laughs> kind of thing, but that's not supposed to come here. Yeah. And there's this kind of awakening that, yes, it does. Yeah. And I yeah. think we've, I'm grateful that trauma has come into the conversation. But if I have another client say to me, the color of the garbage cans is triggering me, I yeah. can't be responsible for what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've almost made our clients sicker. Yeah. Then they they came in the door. I think that's the danger of this stuff. Um, thank yeah, thank you so much for being here. It was good. It was I good wouldn't to- miss it. No. And let me know, you know, somewhere besides Facebook that you're doing another one, and I'll be here because uh, I always counted on you for your skepticism. <laughs> well, good. <I> did. <laughs> that's I did. I'll take it. I mean, I mean it. You know, yeah. I sought you out, and it was oh. always that skepticism that I was I was shooting for. Yeah. I appreciate you, Deborah. I do. Well, you. T- let's get together soon. I'd love to. You take care of yourself. It's good to see you. <laughs>